Hi everyone and welcome to SAMA, a program which invites an expert to talk about their area of expertise. Today we are delighted to have Anne Gittleman as our guest expert. The topic for today is radical metabolism, weight loss and hormone balance. Now the problem of weight gain is prevalent in today's modern world. The global obesity epidemic is worsening daily. During today's summer, we will discuss how people can reverse that trend and return to their ideal weight naturally. Anne is a New York Times best-selling author of over 30 books. Gosh, Anne, I don't know how you do that. On diet, <laughs> detoxing, the environment, and women's health. She's regarded as a nutritional visionary and a health pioneer who has fearlessly stood on the front lines of holistic and integrative medicine. A Columbia University graduate, Anne has been recognized as one of the top 10 nutritionists in the country by Self Magazine and has received the Medical um, Writers Association Award for Excellence and Humanitarian Award from the Cancer Control, <laughs> Cancer Control Society. So welcome to our show, Anne. It's fantastic to have you with us. It's good to be with you. Hello and hello to all of our wonderful viewers and listeners. Now, the topics that you have written about are topics which are red hot at the moment. Weight gain with the lifestyles that people have now, the diets that they're eating, their lack of exercise, the whole metabolism is slowing down. Um, what is this term radical metabolism? That's a really, ca really fantastic <laughs> catch line there. Well, it's kick-starting your metabolism into such a way that you're getting the results you deserve. In other words, it's eating, drinking, taking the right supplements, supporting the right glands, your thyroid, your liver, your gallbladder, so that your metabolism is humming along the way it did when you were 20 or 25. And what I'm finding is that we're increasingly becoming toxic waste dumps. And that means that all the toxins are slowing us down and our thyroids are particularly taking that hit. You've got chemicals in the environment like the chlorine in the water, the fluoride in your toothpaste, even the bromide that are in your soft drinks. All of those do a number on the thyroid. But what I learned, which is the most radical thing of all in radical metabolism, like number is one. that there is Yes, <laughs> is that there is a connection between the thyroid and the gallbladder or lack thereof. So bile is the new weight loss secret. It's very important that whatever you do, that you look to the bile the way you look to probiotics. So I wrote this book to bust every nutritional myth out there and to rewrite the rules of nutrition because clearly what we're doing isn't working. No, it's not working, is it? Because people go doing these fad diets and they're reading up on these new ways of losing weight and it just doesn't happen. And just a reminder to our online viewers, just write in the chat section um, at the bottom of your screens and you can enter your, your questions directly. So why is bile so important? I, I, saw, I, watched, a, I watched a video on um, YouTube, a previous video which you made, and you're talking about this, the gallbladder and the link between the gallbladder and your thyroid. Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy link that nobody has written about. I stumbled on it, quite honestly, when I was doing a, I think it was a summit on uh, the microbiome. And the doctor that was interviewing me said, have you noticed that when people get their gallbladders out, they then develop hypothyroidism a couple of months later? And I said, to be honest with you, when I ask questions of my women mostly and my men, when there's an issue with the gallbladder, we see something happening with the thyroid. And it can go vice versa. So I found some research that suggests that people that do not have optimal bile flow are seven times more likely to suffer from hypothyroidism. So there's an interesting alliance between these organs that nobody has made the connection to. So I think if you want to be thin and healthy and detox successfully, you've got to get your bile flowing, you have to decongest it, and in so doing, you'll kick off your thyroid function and be thin the way you deserve to be. Can we take a step back and just explain what the function is of the thyroid and why it's so important? 
it's, it's a metabolic gland. It's very important in terms of keeping your temperature level. And it's also very sensitive to heat, to air, to chemicals in the environment. It's very sensitive to gluten because gluten looks very similar to the thyroid tissue itself. So it's exceedingly sensitive in this day and age because of all the radiation that surrounds us, the 5G that's coming, the cell phones that we're exposed to, the nuclear radiation that are leaking all over the place, Fukushima, you name it, it's being attacked. So you've got to support the thyroid, whatever you do. That's where the gallbladder comes in and certain supplements that I talk about in the book. The thyroid is the most important and sensitive gland, and it picks up where the adrenals have left off. So the two go hand in hand to keep you humming along, to keep your metabolism good, and to help with overall hormones. Okay, and a little bit earlier you were saying about the things that were basically attacking or suppressing the thyroid. You mentioned chlorine, bromide, and fluoride. Fluoride. Yes. Those are, they're, they're, halogen. they're, they're halogens, and I know you have a biology, biochemistry background, if I'm not mistaken. So they can displace iodine in the thyroid. That's pretty well known these days. And then, of course, there's another mineral. It's a sneaky mineral that nobody's talking about that is a double-edged sword, which is copper. And we're seeing that copper can impact the thyroid as well. And copper is coming from the copper pipes, copper pipes, the copper pots and pans, the copper IUDs if you're a female, or your fillings. Because since the, the, uh, it's 1996, the high amalgam fillings have a higher degree of copper, which then is eliminated and emitted from those fillings and can leach and leak into your system. So we're copper toxic, which is impacting the thyroid. So not only do we have the fluoride, bromide, and chlorine, but you got this new toxin in the 21st century, which is copper. So having said that, there are all of these assaults that are attacking the thyroid. You've got to keep it protected at all costs. Right. Now, the copper is quite an interesting one because a lot of people wear copper bangles for joint pains. And the copper yeah, because copper is a double-edged sword. I'll go back to my original comment. Some people are deficient in bioavailable copper, and many of us have too much copper that is not bioavailable and usable. You need about two, I think it's about two MCGs of copper a day. Many of us that are on vegetarian or vegan style diets are getting way more copper than that. We're getting it in our avocados, our nuts and seeds and our soy products. So it's coming through the environment and then compounded with a vegetarian vegan diet that needs to be better balanced with zinc, for example, which counteracts copper, or from your supplements. So you need to look at the supplements to make sure that there's not excess copper that's adding insult to injury. Gosh, that's, that's, that's a surprise. Um, now, we've got a, um, an early question from Christine Bradburn. She asks, um, uh, she knows someone on a thyroid medication and would love to know how to get that person off the medication. Is there, do you have much experience and with um, rejuvenating yes. it, like thyroid? So Reju they, rejuvenating a tired and toxic and tuckered out thyroid. Yes. Um, the, the first thing we have to do is know what the numbers are. We have to know what the T4 is and the T3. Those numbers ideally should be in the upper two thirds of what's considered normal. Because okay. what's considered normal on a blood test is no longer normal. It's just the levels of a sick population. So you want to be in the upper two thirds, the upper one third ideally. That's number one. Okay. You've got to make sure that the inactive T4 becomes activated and turns into T3, which is the active hormone that keeps you slim and trim and is so helpful for overall hormonal health. So what you do is make sure that that individual has adequate selenium. That would be my first nutrient to go to. And that would be selenium to the amount of either 200 to 400 MCGs, bioavailable selenium from a yeast-free source. Or have that individual take about four, four different, four kinds of nuts. And the best nut is Brazil nut. The so I would take four Brazil nuts a day to get the proper amount of selenium. Very important. And then there's another nutrient called inositol, 
myo-inositol. And I suggest 600 milligrams of myo-inositol would be helpful. Now, I would also need to know if this particular type of hypothyroidism is an autoimmune hypothyroid. Is there an autoimmune disease associated with this? Maybe your Christina could let us know that. Okay, as in like Hashimoto's, for example. Which is almost epidemic all over the world these days, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Another question's come in. Well, there's two other questions that have come in. Uh, I, think, I think it's from Facebook. I, I've had to refer to my phone because I've got Facebook problems today on my computer. So please excuse me if I look slightly to one side. This is from Tamil Bruce. And uh, Tamil asks, uh, we'd love to know your thoughts on the nutritional way of eating. Now, there's similarities. What you would recommend is a path to health, or would you recommend something which is much different? Um, nutritional way. I, th I guess she's asking, is there anything very different in the way they were eating now, our diets of today? Are there, is there anything different? I think it's the source of oils, the, the toxins in the environment, the pesticides in the food, the yes. GMOs, which are in the food, all the yes. Roundup, which is affecting us, the glyphosate's affecting the thyroid, affecting autoimmune issues, affecting mm -hmm. autism. So it's the purity of the food. I think we all should be eating, and I talk about this in Radical Metabolism, locally sourced, organic as much as possible, humanely raised food. Yes. I do not think there is one diet appropriate for everybody. Yes. We have different genetic inheritance, inheritances, inheritances. We have different ethnic backgrounds. You should be eating basically what your ancestors ate for dinner. If you're from Northern Europe, look for a Northern European diet, Southern mm -hmm. Europe, and you can have a different type of diet. Not everybody should be overdoing coconut oil or chocolate or avocados. You've got to eat what natively your DNA responds to. So having said that, I believe an individualizing diet according to your ancestry, your ethnicity, mm -hmm. as well to some degree on your ability to metabolize fats, which is why I'm not a believer that keto is appropriate for everybody. Okay. Not if you do not metabolize fat or if you don't have a gallbladder, the focus, of course, of my radical book. Why would someone not have a gallbladder? Why would they have their gallbladder removed? Because they have gallbladder stones. It's become gangrene. The gallbladder has become congested. And that may be because of major food intolerances like eggs, number one, like onions, number two, like pork, number three, Gosh. or because they haven't broken down the fats because they don't have enough bile thinning elements, like lecithin, for example, betaine from beans, or even enough lemon juice or even lime juice in the diet. You need something in the diet to break down fats, to break down stones, and you can do that quite easily with bitters or a little bit of ox bile. Good gracious. So instead of taking bitters or ox, ox bile, did you say? Yes. Okay. In, instead of doctors recommending this, they take out your gallbladder. And then that has replications further down the track with your thyroid. Well, there, there can be. But once you have stones, you have to go to a little different uh, oh. technique here. You've got to kick it up a notch. You've got to get something that will actually break up the stones. Something right. like phosphoric acid. There's products on the market that have that contain phosphoric acid. They break up stones in the gallbladder. Yes. And you'll also want to increase your intake of hydrochloric acid and bitters like gentian root, angelica root, and even a little bit of dandelion root is considered a bitter. So getting back to bitters is very important for everybody because we're all eating a higher fat diet. Right. And so this, you're saying dandelion root, you could have that as a tea? As a tea, you make leave it to coffee, <laughs> dandelion root tea or coffee. And I'll tell you another thing, the right kind of coffee is also considered a bitter if it's organic and yes. mold free. Right, right. So it's actually good for you. Well, you've heard this from the, the expert today, everybody. Good organic coffee is good for you. <laughs> well, good for your gallbladder. Yeah. It's good for your gallbladder. It's good for your liver. There are tons, there's lots of research about it. I'm not personally a coffee drinker, so I use a decaf version of what I consider the healthiest coffee on the planet. So it's very important if, in fact, you want to increase your 
your muscle mass because it helps to increase and solidify muscle mass, number one. And number two, it's good to slash high blood pressure and it may affect and impact positively Alzheimer's and your ability to sleep. There are lots of antioxidants in coffee. Chlorogenic acid is a secret weight loss weapon, but you gotta have it in the right coffee. You don't wanna be drinking a cup of pesticides. No, no. And isn't that amazing, the impact that one company has had in the, in the, in the whole world? One company. And, uh, well, well, it's a company that, that recognizes and understands how important it is to have a pesticide-free coffee, number one, because coffee is loaded with pesticides. It's one of the most important cash crops we have. Yeah. So there, naturally, there'd be a lot of protective pesticides that the farmers are going to use. So that mm -hmm. company is one that I write about in the book. It's known as Purity. I think they select their coffee beans from all over the country, and they select the level of antioxidants because coffee is one of the highest antioxidant foods in the in the world number one number two it's the most popular drink so thank god we've got something that people are already drinking that we can now make good for them it is a tool for weight loss right now it's really meaning monsanto how monsanto have done the done the dirty on pretty much everybody you can't get away from their product now because it's so prevalent in agriculture it's, it's prevalent in some of the best wines in our country as well. So that's really very sad. And we think that the great increase in gluten intolerance is really an increase in glyphosate intolerance. Right. So um, you gotta, you, you got to get clean, got to get organic. You have to source as much as you can, go to a farm-to-table restaurant, or grow your own. Yeah. <laughs> And the, um, the, uh, another good thing about buying organic is you get to meet people, <laughs> meet the farmers, meet the people who, built, who, um, who grew the crops. So it's got that side yeah. benefit as well. <laughs> okay, another question's coming. This one from Irene uh, Gomolka. Uh, Irene is asking, do you recommend, I'm sorry, how do you recommend jump-starting your thyroid if it tends to be underactive? Um, she says that she knows that sea vegetables seems to help in the short term. And I guess that's the iodine. It's in the sea vegetable. It's the iodine. If you get a little iodine tincture at the pharmacy, at the, at the um, drugstore, and I don't know where Irene is, and you get a little colored iodine tincture and you paint a little bit of it on your arm, watch and see how quickly it dissolves. It absorbs into the system. That little iodine tincture, that little nickel that you draw on your arm, should disappear within 24, should not disappear within 24 hours. It should stay on your body. If it disappears before 24 hours, it may show you have an iodine deficiency. And yes, iodine is one of the most efficient minerals we have. Not so good if you have Hashimoto's, you can't really take extra iodine. But any other kind of thyroid issue can be kick-started with extra iodine. Get a healthy kelp that's not from the Pacific Ocean, which is contaminated because of the nuclear radiation. So you need a little healthy kelp, maybe some gamasio, which contains kelp, some wakame, uh, some hajiki. There are lots of great seaweeds out there that you can use to jumpstart your thyroid and use the selenium I'm talking about and that myo-inositol as well as read radical metabolism and make sure that your old gallbladder is working properly. Are you a fan of mueslis in the morning? Because mueslis, they've got the nuts, the grains, they've got the, um, the wholesome foods all in one bowl. You've got the nuts, the grains, the seeds, all of that as well, as long as it's organic. And it also, I think, is made from oats, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, or is yes. it from wheat? Is it oats or wheat? Uh, well, I can't I, recall. Uh, I think historically, it's, it's, as far as I know, it's, it's um, oats, but there's different variations of the um, of music. It's basically whatever you can fit into a bowl. <laughs> yeah, and you just and you just want to make sure if you're jump starting your thyroid, you want to make sure that the muesli has enough protein. So you may get a protein powder that you would use as a kind of milk substance maybe a whey protein made from A2 milk. So you'll jumpstart your thyroid with more protein because protein enhances metabolism. You need more protein when you have a slow working thyroid. 
more protein mm -hmm. and sometimes less carbohydrates. It's interesting. Um, is it uh, what happens when you when you start aging? Um, I'm told that when you get a little bit older, your metabolism slows down. Um, are there any ways that you can maintain your metabolism of your earlier years so you don't? <laughs> well, that's the magic bullet that we're all looking for. So as you get older, you cannot metabolize as many carbohydrates. Anybody that's a little older, and I don't know how old or young you are, you're a young man at this point, but I can tell you as one who is past 50, that everything starts to slow down and it takes more maintenance than it ever did before. So you slow down on your carbohydrates. You probably shouldn't be intaking more than 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates a day. You've got to become a carbohydrate counter. That's number one. Number two, you need the right oils to jumpstart metabolism. The oils I talk about in my book, the hemp seed oil, the sesame seed oil, a little bit of tahina, you need the right oils, you need the right protein, you need to lessen your carbohydrates, and you need to exercise on a daily basis, as we all know, because your muscles are innate calorie burners. So all of that is imperative as we grow older, and because we're being exposed, because we're on the planet longer, to more toxins. So you have to detoxify either with an infrared sauna, make that part of your detox routine, coffee enemas, which are so important, as well as, I would say, periodic fast, where you decrease your food intake or look at intermittent fasting twice a week. Wow, that's quite often. I thought you were going to say twice a month, but <laughs> twice a week. Wow. Yeah, the research seems to suggest that twice a week, probably on a weekend for most people, is the most helpful way to maintain the weight that you have and to cleanse the system on a cellular level, because that's what we want to do. Nutrients in, toxins out, and it all begins on the cellular level. I think you'd need to have quite good willpower, because the weekend, of course, is the time you need to hear down all the days of uh, those of you that have hair. Let your hair down and, and just relax, you know, um, kick back, watch a bit of TV, do the things that you know are naughty, but they're a little bit of fun. So <laughs> now, now we're talking about fasting on, a, on the day that you're supposed to be having a, a break. So do it on a Monday. Do it on okay. a Monday and a Thursday. There you go. <laughs> and what, fa what would this fasting involve? How long would you, is it not eating food at all? Just drinking water? Not, not eating food in about an 11 hour, or sometimes a 16 hour window. So you just eat in a shorter window of time. It's really very simple. I outline it in, in radical metabolism very mm -hmm. easily. And some people swear by intermittent fasting. It's a huge, huge trend in our country. For those of us that have low blood sugar, I'm one of them. It's not the, it's not the technique that I use, but I have to tell you that it works for an amazing amount of people. Eight out of 10 of my followers love to intermittent fast. It's cleansing, it's detoxifying, and they don't have to eat first thing in the morning. They may eat from 11 to six, for example, and get in all their food. And they feel better, and some people have lost weight. So, you know, it's different strokes for different folks. There's not one program, one diet, one routine that works for everybody. That's the important thing. We're all biologically very unique. Well, it's got several ones, hasn't it? It also means you save a little bit on food costs. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could look at it that way. Well, there's a positive to everything. Now, um, does drinking water increase your metabolism? And if so, how much should one drink? Uh, the usual recommendation is about half of your body weight in ounces. So if, you're, if you weigh 120, it's 60 ounces a day. So I believe that, yes, it can be helpful. There's some research to indicate that cold water will actually enhance metabolism. But I think when you're in a colder climate, you want something warming that doesn't shock your organs. So I'm a big believer, believe it or not, of getting up in the morning and having a big glass of warm water, room temperature water or hot water with a juice of half a lemon to clean the gallbladder, to clean the liver, to tonify the kidneys, and basically cleanse the palate. I'm a big believer in bitter, because my whole mantra in radical metabolism is bitter is better. You've just described, actually, the way the Chinese do it. They don't drink cold water. 
room temperature water they consider cold. They heat up water before they drink it, without fail, basically. And in the morning, they generally have a large glass of hot water. And it's sometimes quite scalding hot. I've, I have difficulty drinking that. Yes, of course. Well, we don't want it scalding hot. They, they may have a better tolerance than we do, but I think that's very wise. Hot water, warm water, very soothing to the system and cleanses the palate and cleanses the toxins that could have been released in the body over the, the, the fast after you have uh, slept, ho hopefully for a good eight hours. Right. Does it help with the bile production? The, 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 what helps with the bile production are the use of bitters. The lemon is the aspect that helps with the bile production. So if you okay. look at bitters in the diet, you can look at lemon or you can look at lime or you look at dandelion root tea or coffee. That will help to thin the bile. That would be very helpful. Or even bitter greens from endive, arugula, uh, radicchio, um, watercress, all of those greens are essentially very good for cleansing the liver, decongesting the bile, because bile, as I say, is a hidden weight loss secret because bile helps to break down fat. It also detoxifies the system and flushes them out and has the same ability to trigger the metabolism of the thyroid. When the body breaks down fat with a secretion of bile, it triggers an enzyme that converts the T4 to the T3. So that's a very important alliance that we should never forget. So bile is pretty much a linchpin. It's, it's, it's a major part of your detox system, I guess, isn't it? It's not just my detox system. It's a major part of everybody that's listening of our body. <laughs> it is the original, de it's the original detox method. All of your heavy metals are thrown into the bile. All those excess hormones are thrown into the bile. It's what we call a binder. It's nature's natural innate binder. Wow. And what health consequences would one experience if they aren't producing enough bile? The consequences of not enough bile are bloatingness, bloatiness, poochiness, gassiness, stools that are white, pain in your shoulder blades, primarily on the right side, um, problems sometimes with hearing and dizziness and waking up between, I think it's 11 and 1, not being able to sleep properly. So all of those things are symptomatic of not enough bile or not enough free-flowing bile. And remember, and I talk about this a lot in the book, there's also a major food sensitivity connection. So if you want to get rid of gallbladder stones and get rid of the pain that's associated with them, you have to follow the detox or elimination diet that I outline in the book. People have gotten remarkable results, not just with weight loss, but they've been able to get off of their thyroid medication just by dealing with the bile because bile is brilliant. It's beautiful and it's very much under appreciated because nobody's writing or talking about it. Right. Now you mentioned a little bit earlier before about ox bile. That sounded quite strong. Yeah, ox bile is particularly important. You know, if you don't have a thyroid, you have thyroid replacement therapy. Yes. If you don't have a gallbladder, you should be on a gallbladder replacement therapy. And most right. doctors do not put their patients on anything. They take out the gallbladder and they just let them alone. Well, many people then have problems digesting fats and utilizing the fat-soluble vitamins A and E and D and E. So you need something that mirrors the way the regular bile would respond. When you're eating foods, the body should be secreting bile from, which is a digestive fluid, from the liver. It is then stored in the gallbladder. When you don't have a gallbladder to time the release of bile at the intake of fatty foods, the bile just keeps drip, drip, dripping into the system, which can create irritation and create problems with elimination. So you want to take a supplement, either the ox bile, which you can get at a health food store, or one called Bile Builder that I created with ox bile and betaine and other food sources and nutrients, or even some of your bitters, 
so that you can digest the fat when you're eating it. That way you, you're digesting properly, you're detoxing properly, and you're triggering the release of T4 into activated T3. It's remarkable, isn't it, for an organ that actually plays such a major role in your body, the gallbladder. It's, yeah, it's, a, not a throw, it's not a throwaway organ. No, the it's gallbladder not. does not belong in the throwaway organ club. I'm the first to tell you that. <laughs> If they take it out of you, well, if, if, okay, well, there will be people that will be watching this video who uh, will be having their gallbladders removed soon. Now, if someone, that they'll remove your gallbladder if, if it's got stones. Is that right? If it's blocked up? There's it? usually a lot, there, well, some, you know, there are cases of this where you go to the point where there's a lot of blockage and that, that can be very dangerous. And I'm not one to tell you you shouldn't get your gallbladder out. I'm saying if you want to look for an alternative method, number one, pick up the book. That's very important. Number two, look at some of the herbal remedies we suggest, as well as the other products on the market that break down stones naturally. Okay, so not all is lost necessarily, even if you, um, even if um, the doctor said, no, you've got to take it out, there's still maybe hope. Let's say there's a week. There's, there's, there's always hope. And it's an important organ as we get older because it's so important with all the fats that you're eating, particularly if you're on a keto style diet, which I don't recommend for many people for various reasons, a paleo style diet or even a primal diet that have the wrong kinds of fats that are very hard on your system, very hard on your liver and completely toxic to the gallbladder. Right, okay. Um, there's a couple of questions come through. Um, Kathy Aquistapace has asked, is eating nutritional yeast a good way to get B vitamins in the diet? Um, many people do very well with nutritional yeast. Yes. So I would say if there is no other fungal or yeast type problem, sometimes it can cross react with people that have yeast or fungus or mold, then it probably could be a very good thing, especially for a vegetarian. Right. Okay. Okay. Because you know it contains certain types of B12, which could be very helpful. That's interesting. What about B6? Because B6 is one of the things which uh, vegetarians tend to be quite low on. It's a source of all the B vitamins, yes, and B6. Okay, okay, that's great. Um, does, okay, uh, uh, Christine Bradburn, uh, she says, I love essential oils. Well, Christine, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> People are rediscovering them as, as a, a true healing um, oil or types of oils. But um, what do you think about essential oils, she asked. I'll be getting your book after the show. Thank you very much. So what do you think about essential oils? Because we haven't covered them yet, have we? You're talking, you're talking about the plant-based essential oils. I'm talking about the essential fatty acids, and I love them both. Yes. And in terms of the system, I'm especially fond of essential oils like lemongrass, cypress, and gentian. Those are three oils that help to break down fats. Very good for cellulite and very good for the circulation, very good for the limb. I think that they're one of nature's most powerful plant pharmacies. And I love the idea, if you're coming down with the flu, of rubbing a little bit of frankincense on the bottom of your soles and putting that in the carrier oil and going to sleep at night. I also adore rosemary oil, which I believe can protect your thyroid against radiation. So I'm a big believer in essential oils. I've used it in my practice for over 30 years. So I'm here to say that they're here to stay. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, let's have a look. I'm just seeing if there's the other. Um, okay, hormone balance. This is another topic we're supposed to be covering for today, so we better start talking about it. Oh, yeah, let's talk hormones, this, this, my favorite topic. Second is favorite. Uh, now, why, why is hormone balance your favorite topic then, Anne? Is there because one? I've written, because I've been through every hormone, uh, or every hormonal challenge known to man. I was a PMS sufferer. I was perimenopausal, wrote a book, was menopausal, wrote a book. I'm beyond menopause, and I'll be writing another book. So I'm very familiar. As a female, <laughs> only a female can understand the PMS from hell, which could be perimenopause, the PMS situation that goes away and turns into menopause. And what happens to women who offer oftentimes have challenges with aging and weight due to a hormonal 
meltdown. So I know quite a bit about it. So what do we need to talk about with hormones? Well, okay. The, uh, the big question, I guess, is um, what can we do to support our hormone production and our hormone balance? This foods and fats. Okay, so here's the infomercial. It's radical metabolism. Why? Because the liver is the metabolism gland next to the thyroid, which breaks down hormones. You want to keep it in tip-top shape. The bile is the mechanism that breaks down hormones into usual, usual, usable metabolites. So you've got to make sure that those whole systems and organs are functioning properly. You do that with a bitter diet. You do that with the dandelion routine with the lemon that we talked about. Mm. You do that by getting rid of excess copper in the diet that leads to estrogen dominance that can affect women in westernized countries because there's too much estrogen in the environment, in the plastics, the pesticides, and the paints. And if they're taking hormone replacement from either traditional hormone therapy or even bioidentical, they run the risk of too much hormone in relationship to progesterone. So the book will help you on all those levels. The proper oil is important for hormones to keep your skin, hair, and nails looking good. And I think we get a fighting chance if we get rid of the extra estrogens, make sure that our our liver is toned and that our bile is flowing freely because it is the detox mechanism for all hormones, good and bad. Right. Um, birth control pills, are they something to avoid if you've got any form of Well, it, uh, <laughs> that's another double-edged sword. The birth control pill of this day and age is much better than when I was coming up in the ranks in the 70s and the 80s. So what I can tell you is that they have a lesser degree of estrogen, so they're, they're much better. Some women need them. So what I'm going to say is if you're taking a birth control pill, also take good care of your liver. Get a little bit of the bile builder I talk about. You have some dandelion routine. Look to the liver on a daily basis to tonify it, to support it with bitter foods. That's what would be important, and also to protect your yourself and your body against excess yeast, which can be a byproduct of every birth control on the market. Did you say excess yeast? Yeast. As in candida. As in candida, the fungus among us. Okay. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Smokes us. I heard that one before. And that's where essential oils, that's where your oregano oil comes into play. It's an excellent candida fighter. Gosh, it's, that's one of the strongest most burning oils I know. <laughs> if you've got any on your, on your fingers, you, you've got to be careful where you touch us, what you touch, because it starts burning. It's very, very strong. It's very strong, but it's so potent. It's probably one of the highest known. It, it has the highest known antioxidants of all the herbs. Uh, you're looking at the highest antioxidant herbs are none other than oregano, cloves, and rosemary. Those are the top three. Yes, I can believe cloves, but rosemary is a bit of a surprise. I thought it was oh, rosemary. Let's never forget rosemary. It's good for the hair, good for the memory. Just sniff it every day. You'll, you'll, you'll have your memory as sharp as a tap. And it's very good for the thyroid. It's very protective. Wow. These are the gems you'd like to hear about. <laughs> Why not? And these are easy peasy. All of this is very easy for people to, to do. Gosh, it's interesting. Very interesting. I'll move this box to one side so I can read what the question is. Um, okay, we're bouncing back to bile again. Um, and it's a question you've kind of answered already, but why does moving your bile keep you thin? Why does moving your bile keep you thin? Because in the secretion of bile, the body is triggered to release an enzyme that works on the thyroid. It yes. triggers the release of an enzyme that converts T4 to T3. Yes. So that's what we have found in the research in Harvard and in Finland. People that have problems with bile flow or who have a gallbladder removed then suffer from a uh, thyroid slowdown months or years later. That's why a lot of women are over 40, or overtired, and very overweight because they no longer have their thyroids or their gallbladders. Right. Right. Well, okay, energy. What are your favorite, personal favorite energy giving foods? Energy? Energy, this raw energy, power, so you can start burning off, exercising your muscles. And... 
Uh, what's what's my favorite energizing food? Uh, oh. Probably crayon water. Cranberry juice with water? Cranberry juice. Well, it's my signature food that I wrote about in a book called The Fat Flesh Plan. So I use one ounce of unsweetened cranberry juice. This is a magical, this is magic for your people, particularly women that want to get rid of cellulite. It's one ounce of unsweetened cranberry juice to seven ounces of water. Oh, that's simple. And you do that, let me see, you do that eight times a day. So you have eight glasses a day. Yes. It's very energizing because it balances your pH, it's loaded with antioxidants, it mm. strengthens the cell wall, and it flushes the lymph. So you're flushing toxins, you're going to the bathroom, it's tonifying the kidneys and the bladder, it's getting rid of any kind of infection, and it's very high in the antioxidants that are very good for your skin and the blood vessel walls. Right. And by cranberry juice, you're not talking about supermarket. Juice, are you no, about it's the unsweetened cranberry juice. The bitters. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, Rosa Sate has asked a question, and she's um, the question reads is this Are you familiar with the genetic blood disorder called uh, pyrrole disorder, which affects about 10% of the population? It actually sounds yeah, like. We're talking, it's a connection, it's a, it's a vitamin B6 issue, as I recall. That's vitamin right. B6 and um, zinc. She writes, it, it leads to severe deficiencies in B6, zinc, magnesium, and, and more. There's often an underlying cause of digestive issues in many other conditions. I guess what... Yeah, she, she's, she's right. This is not a new issue. This is one that was written about by Dr. Carl Pfeiffer uh, in the 1980s. And there are many ways of testing for this. We have a lab in our country called the Great Plains Lab that actually can test for this disorder. So you need to take proper supplements, get your foods in order to make sure you're absorbing the proper kind of B6 and the proper kind of zinc. But I must tell you, regardless of whether you have this pyrrole disorder or not, most people in our country, and I bet this is worldwide, are very zinc deficient. They're iodine deficient, as we discussed earlier, the magnesium deficient, and they're zinc deficient. And zinc competes with copper. So with so much copper in the diet, we're not absorbing enough zinc. It goes round and round. Right, right. Would the deficiencies be due to the processing of the foods now, things coming in cans and packets, rather than open stalls? Uh, it's... it's it comes from a variety of reasons. It's multifaceted as every situation always is. I think it's the processing of the foods, the refining of the foods, and the fact that we're eating too many of certain types of foods and not others. There are a lot of people that are not eating zinc-rich foods like pumpkin seeds or eggs, or they're getting rid of all their red meat, which probably isn't appropriate for certain types of individuals who have certain biochemical unique makeups. So I think they're not eating properly, I think there's a lot of fast foods, and I think you're under so much stress, you're losing these. You're losing magnesium in your urine. You're, using, you're utilizing zinc when you sweat. So there are many different ways. The environment, stress, toxicity, all of those play a part. So that's why knowing what your deficiencies are is a key. I do this with my people by taking a hair analysis. We use two tablespoons of hair, which is non-invasive, to figure out their minerals, their toxicities, and the ratios, and then figure out what's doing in the environment that's creating the deficiency. When you're doing these tests, do you find they, the results are quite similar because it's so prevalent, some of the um, deficiencies in their diet? I find a couple of things. I find that zinc is sufficient, copper is excessive. I find that calcium can be over the, uh, the line, meaning that it's too excessive. I find that magnesium needs to be increased. I find that the adrenals are suffering and then that kicks into the thyroid and then I find that there's a lot of aluminum, there's a lot of uranium we're finding in people's hair, they're excreting uranium and mercury and lead and nickel. So the toxic overload is increasing. It's very disconcerting. Uh, um, the aluminum, I guess, would be from the cooking utensils. What are your views on things like non-stick fry pans, which are aluminum covered with a plastic material that Oh no, have. throw them out. The worst. Because what you're cooking in, you're dining in. So if you cook in plastic, 
you're eating plastic, you're absorbing plastic. If you're cooking in aluminum, you're dining on aluminum. If you're cooking in copper, you're dining on copper. If you're cooking in cast iron, you're dining on iron. And that's one of the most hidden of all toxic metals. And it's another double-edged sword similar to copper. So with the iron, you have to take your ferritin level every year. If you're over the age of 50, if you're a woman, if you're a man over the age of 25, you start stockpiling iron from the foods that you eat, from the environment, and from those darn cast iron pots and pans that you inherited from your grandmother. And even if it's well seasoned, you can absorb iron into your food, creating a problem in your blood. We're now seeing all kinds of diseases related to toxic iron overload that nobody suspected. Diseases of the heart, the brain, from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's, to problems with diabetes, obesity, problems with aging, with all the brown spots. A lot of that is connected to excess iron. So cast away your cast iron, read the book, only get the best stainless steel, cook in parchment paper, cook in unglazed ceramic or unglazed clay. There are all kinds of ways to do this, but looking at your pots and pans is incredibly important for a radical metabolism. Gosh. Mm. When I see the- Not a food for thought this night, huh? It's, it's pretty scary because when you go to a shop to buy a saucepan, most of the range is aluminium and the rest of it is aluminium covered with non-stick, which is supposed to be fantastic. What about the ones which are, they say they're ceramic non-stick? They say they're Well, they're probably stick. better, but sometimes they can crack. Everything can crack, so you want enamel-covered iron is probably the most hardy. You want glass, you want Pyrex. There's a lot of good things in even corningware. I, I give you a whole list in the book, and if you buy the book, at RadicalMetabolism.com, you get a free list of how to stock your pantry from the get-go. So we tell you what to buy. But the reality is, it's not just what you're eating, it's what you're cooking in that could be killing you. And right. people need to know this information. Right, gosh. What about leaded glass? Does the lead leach out? Because you have leaded wine goblets, for example. Right. Lead will leach out. That was the downfall of the Roman Empire, for God's sakes. They used to use goblets made of um, lead. So you don't want anything with lead. Lead is not healthy. But glass, a, if you had clay and it was a glass glazed clay, that would be very good. Clay is actually very healthy if it's not glazed with cadmium or lead, but okay. glass. It's really, so if a glass has got a lead in, in it to make it more clear, the lid will come out. That's fine. That's fine. The glass doesn't have any lead. That's fine. Pyrex would be healthy. Corningware is healthy. You can get these brands on the internet or all over okay. the country. Sure, but some glasses do have lead in it. Well, then look for corningware. Okay. 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 Gosh, so many things to look forward to. Okay, well, um, I've left the very best to last, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to leave on a high note. So, okay, now we're going to talk about aging. Now, you've got the seven best steps for healthier aging. Now, aging, everyone tries to, I guess only, there's only one way to avoid aging, which isn't a good thing to do. So, we'll talk about the ways of aging gracefully and healthily. How can one. Well, I think, how can aging? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think number one, you have to make friends with the skin that you're in. So learning to use the right oils, essential oils and essential fatty acids. One of the best anti-aging oils is pomegranate oil, believe it or not. Yeah. Yarrow oil is another one. And the third one for the essential fatty acids is hemp seed oil. Very good for the skin, hair and nails as a beautifier. So get thee to some oil. So oil up and get thee to an oil change. Oil is very important internally and externally and to be used on the bottom of your feet as well. I'm in love with oils of all kinds, the plant oils, the hemp seed oil. So you want seven steps to aging. <laughs> okay, that's the first I was, step. I was lining you up. This is how the question was presented to me, but now just tell me if, just 
uh, let us know the best okay, way. Okay, I'm going to get along with you and other. We can do 10, we can do 20, it's fine. The second one is detox on a regular basis, which means daily you have to take something to help detoxify your system. Yes. Quite honestly, I use magnesium as my detoxifier. I find that magnesium acts as a natural regulator. So the amount of magnesium you should take is five milligrams per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 100 pounds, you would take 500 milligrams of magnesium. Gosh, that's that's how you figure out what you need. We need a lot more than we're given credit for because you're losing magnesium because you're under such stress from natural stressors and the stress of the environment. So magnesium would be my number two. My number three, is to drink as much pure water as you can with a water filter that's designed for the locale in which you live. In other words, it can block the absorption of fluoride or chlorine or even copper depending upon your locale. And I have sources in the book that will show you where you can get a free water analysis where the water expert will look at the water reports from your part of the world and say, wow, you need a filter that blocks uranium because uranium is in your water as it is in the great state of Idaho where I live. Gosh. So water to the rescue, H2O is very important for your overall health. Mm. And now I would say is number four or five, wherever we are on the list, you have to be regular, which we talked about in terms of magnesium. You have to move on a daily basis. You have to move yes. your lymph. That's where rebounding comes into play, jumping on a trampoline for about 10 to 15 minutes. That's very healthy. Yes. And you have to eat enough protein. As we get older, you need 100 grams of protein a day. Not 20, not 30, but 100. So if you're a vegan or a, ve or a vegetarian, then you've got to add some beans, some lentils, you've got to add some um, sprouts, you've got to add some nuts and seeds. Get that number up to at least 100. And last but not least, practice the art of gratitude. Gratitude is an attitude that is very healing for the body, the mind, and the spirit. Right. Also gets your stress levels down. You can pass your stress on to the other person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good, good advice you're giving him now. And um, if you follow those rules, the, this, I don't know how many steps we ended up in the, in the end, but it's roughly about seven, wasn't it, Anne? If you, if you do those steps, then your body's function will maintain its, its function even in the, in the eight later years, so you age gracefully. Is that right? Well, God willing, hopefully. And then the other thing that is important that I didn't mention is as much as you can to de-plug from all of your devices. And this is something that I find is very near and dear to my heart. You know, all of the electrical vices or devices we have, which I think are vices to some degree, from your cell phone to your computer to your iPad to the smart meters that are now all around this country are very depleting of your life force energy. So on a daily basis, you have to ground yourself on Mother Earth for at least 10 to 20 minutes or sleep with a grounding wristband so that you're infused with all of those negative electrons that can neutralize the free radicals. That probably in this day and age, in 2019, is exceedingly important to discharge all of this chaotic electricity which is impacting our entire systems on a day-to-day -day basis, 24-7 without it, without stop. If you can get rid of all the electronics in your bedroom, shut off the breakers so that there's no electricity, have a deep night's sleep, that's the best rejuvenating remedy of all. It's hard for many people to do, including ourselves here in China, because we live in apartments. So if you turn everything off, we've got at least four people touching your, the surrounding parts of your apartment, above, below, and either side. So then you ground yourself with the electrical ground. Yeah, but the ground, because you're so far above physical ground, the wire that does go into the peg at the ground is something like 100 feet away or more. Then get me some shungite. I'll tell you what to do. You give me, you give me a little problem there, we'll tell you what to do. See what I'm wearing around my neck? 
is that shown guy, doesn't it? And all of this is written in radical metabolism. We get radical on every aspect. So surround yourself with shungite or take some carbon 60 so you can absorb all the electricity that's in the environment. These are things that you have to do. You've got to find a way to discharge the negative electricity, the man-made electricity, the man-made vibrations, the radiation that surrounds you 24-7. It's 100 million times more than our ancestors, our mothers, fathers, and grandparents were exposed to. So it's a real issue. It's a pollution, an electro-pollution. We're living an experiment. And soon there's been, well, I guess now, um, 5G is coming on. So the experiment is getting even worse. Well, we'll see what happens in that experiment. Anne Giverman, thank you so much for coming on to our show. We've learned such a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's been great. Uh, thanks, thanks for taking time out to, um, to talk to us. We've covered all the, all the bases, talked about the... Uh, yeah, it's, it's remarkable, isn't it? The, the function of the gallbladder. The gallbladder is always in the background. It's sort of like a non-functional type organ that just creates bile and that's it. It's a throwaway, it's a throwaway organ, and, but it is not a throwaway organ. It's essentially very important. So if nothing else, we're going to save some gallbladders. Yes. Let's hope you save a few from the people that watch this video. It's in mm -hmm. um, the thyroid as well. In fact, so many organs, people, you know, I'm sure the appendix does something too. Does the appendix do anything? It does. The appendix is a stockpiling, it's a storage facility for probiotics. Well, that's a good thing as well, then, isn't it? Well, that you, we, we, except, you know, our organs were put there for a purpose. So we've got to do everything we can to save them and use all the alternative methods until it comes to the point where you have to get rid of them because it's a life and death situation. So I'm never saying to get rid of them, but there's so many steps you can do before you get to that point. That's right. And I guess, you know, when you have a, the doctor says you've got to have your X removed, between then and the appointment date, when they do the final test, um, you can do all you can to try and revive it, try and give it the CPR <laughs> to get you all good. Unbelievable. Oh, dear. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks again, Anne. Thanks for, um, now I know you must be hungry. It's, um, you haven't eaten yet, so. I'm going to go eat a radical metabolism food that is good for my gallbladder, my bile, and my liver, and my thyroid. Good on you. <laughs> <Take care. laughs> Okay. You take care too. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Good night.